a reading from The Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly P. Hall. Pomandries, the vision of Hermes. The divine pymander of Hermes Mercurius Trismegistus is one of the earliest of the Hermetic writings now extant. While probably not in its original form, having been remodeled during the first centuries of the Christian era and incorrectly translated since, this work undoubtedly contains many of the original concepts of the Hermetic cultus. The, the divine pymander consists of 17 fragmentary writings gathered together and put forth as one work, the second book of the divine pymander called Poimandries or the Vision is believed to describe the method by which the divine wisdom was first revealed to Hermes. It was after Hermes had received this revelation that he began his ministry, teaching to all who would listen the secrets of the invisible universe as they had been unfolded to him. The vision is the most famous of all hermetic fragments and contains exposition of hermetic cosmogony and the secret sciences of the Egyptians regarding the culture and unfoldment of the human soul. For some time, it was erroneously called the Genesis of Enoch, but that mistake has now been rectified. At hand, while preparing the following interpretation of the symbolic philosophy concealed within the, Her the vision of Hermes, the present author has had three reference works. The Divine Pymander of Hermes Mercurius Trismegistus, London, 1650, translated out of the Arabic and Greek by Dr. Everhard. Hermetica, Oxford, 1924, edited by Walter Scott. Hermes, The Mysteries of Egypt, Philadelphia, 1925, by Edward Shore, and The Thrice Great Hermes, London, 1906, by G.R.S. Mead. To the material contained in the above volumes, he has added commentaries based upon the esoteric philosophy of the ancient Egyptians, together with amplifications derived partly from other Hermetic fragments and partly from the secret arcanum of the Hermetic sciences. For the sake of clarity, the narrative form has been chosen in, re in preference to the original dialogic style, and obsolete words have given place to those in current use. So why am I reading um, some of this, uh, these esoteric texts today? Well, I've been studying um, Hermeticism and Hermetic philosophy um, as a historical, from a historical lens or through a historical lens. And um, Manly P. Hall is a rarefied genius as well, and often um, can be seen as, um, you know, is criticized, I think, uh, un and, and it, it's unwarranted um, because his scholarship was really excellent. Um, but, you know, he's, he's typically tied to the New Age and he's all over the Internet. And, you know, you can take you can take what you find, um, you know, and take him at his word. There's a lot of recordings and teachings that he gave. Um, a very interesting guy. Um, I believe he was sincere and authentic in that he did study these things and uh, had a very, very, um, uh, you know, an incredible index of, of texts to draw from. So he is a very interesting uh, nexus point of all things esoteric and art in the 20th century, I believe. And one of the great, I think, you know, lights of, and, 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 and uh, historians of, of ancient um, human systems of thought and psychology. So I believe he, he, I believe he studies these things in a balanced way and his commentaries are just, I, again, I just think are fantastic. Um, very interesting, just from a historical perspective alone. Um, and sure, you know, he's, he was often, um, you know, he grew up in an age where there was a lot of uh, charlatans and charlatry and, um, it, but, uh, Charlton, you know, he really fought against that. And I think he strove to be a clear, a clear voice, you know, and with a lot of garbage all around him. Ironically, Ronald Reagan and a lot of, um, famous folks did come and study with him because he was so accessible and he was influential in Hollywood in Los Angeles. And he has a library there. Um, but, uh, yeah. You know, this is one of the back corners of, hist I, I would say, historical philosophy or commentary on historical philosophy. So I think it's interesting sometimes to look behind the, the curtain um, and listen to others, you know, and especially ones as, as, as brilliant as, as, as Manly is. Hermes, while wandering in a rocky and desolate place, gave himself over to meditation and prayer. Following the secret instructions of the temple, he gradually freed his higher consciousness from the bondage of his bodily senses and thus released 
his divine nature revealed to him the mysteries of the transcendental spheres. He beheld a figure, terrible and awe-inspiring. It was the great dragon, with wings stretching across the sky and light streaming in all directions from its body. The mysteries taught that the universal life was personified as a dragon. The great dragon called Hermes by name and asked him why he thus meditated upon the world mystery. Terrified by the spectacle, Hermes prostrated himself before the dragon, beseeching it to reveal its identity. The great creature answered that it was Pomandres, the mind of the universe, the creative intelligence, and the absolute emperor of all. A note here, Shur identifies Pomandres as the god Osiris. Hermes then besought Pomandres to disclose the nature of the universe and the constitution of the gods. The dragon acquiesced, bidding Trismegistus hold its image in his mind. So just some uh, commentary from myself uh, about this passage um, so far. This is really interesting. Um, this is the hist This is the source of so much of our myth and some of our mystical images. And this is, you know, Hermetics and the dragon related to Hermetics um, and alchemy. Um, you know, the serpent eat, uh, eating its own tail. Um, these are all, you know, ancient ideas that were translated around the time of Jesus, again, into Greek, probably by Byzantine and Greek authors, but much from much earlier works. is It's theorized from much earlier works. So just from that perspective alone, I find this fascinating. You know, the, 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 the royal religions, I guess, of ancient Egypt, the royal religion was, was very interesting. Um, and it probably had basis, you know, way for, you know, further back to the Sumerians. And, you know, I imagine that these are myths that have been that had been propagated through uh, through early history. Um, now, I think that what's happening here is a psychological del. You know, you could say almost a psychedelic um, kind of journey for Hermes into his own mind, into his unconscious. So Carl Jung would definitely, uh, you know, I think. I, I, well, I'm going to do a reading later about from Carl Jung, but I think Carl Jung definitely, you know, this is, this is, uh, you know, he was an alchemist and he studied alchemy and I found this very interesting, um, uh, you know, the parallels here uh, to his red book. And in a, in a way, Carl Jung kind of talked to, I believe, the dragon Promandries, which is kind of the guardian of your, of your nature, of your mind. And I find it also interesting that uh, this is talking about the dragon as the supreme mind. And that's really what it is, consciousness, you know? I mean, to me, I mean, they're, hint they're talking about consciousness and our, our ability to reason that, some, that we developed at some point. And maybe in those early, I, again, I, I, I find, uh, you know, some interesting theories that talk about perhaps in those early times, you know, we were making our emotions became the foundation uh, for, for the stories of the gods um, as a way to describe and explain, you know, our consciousness. So this is really kind of ancient philosophy. Uh, ancient philosophy and ancient psychology. Um, so I, I, anyway, I, I think that it's illuminating to kind of look at our current evolution of our mind and our culture uh, in, in light of, uh, you know, ancient, uh, you know, ancient uh, ways of thinking um, and ideas about what our consciousness was then. We have theories about the mind now and we have theories of consciousness, but we're, we're, I think, you know, and everybody would agree, it's still a very hard problem. Some would say it's easy because everything's conscious. That's, that's an answer. That's the, that, you know, that's, that's rising today. Even science, some scientists are saying this, you know, everything has every bit of matter has a little consciousness. That means an electron and, a, and an atom, you know, and the quantum, you know, could potentially be aware on some level. Who knows? Right. I mean, those are speculations, but, um, and, and, and more just, uh, you know, abstract, you know, kind of, uh, thought exercises more than anything. Um, but it's, it's also going to be impossible to deduce this in my opinion, from, from just, you know, reductive and, uh, observation, you know, that, you know, the, the, the scientific method is not going to fully illuminate the mind. Um, and especially the way that the mind, you know, the way that our irrational mind functions, you know, and, and, and how our emotions affect our bodies. I mean, these, these are going to be, in my opinion, you know, is a very complex set of, um, you know, inner and outer forces kind of at work here um, to make our personalities and our sense of awareness. Immediately, the form of Pomandres changed. Where it had stood, there was a glorious and pulsating radiance. This light was the spiritual nature of the great dragon itself. 
I, I want to, um, I believe, you know, a better way to, or maybe a, 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 um, a better way to speak about spirituality is really the, the exploration of our own nature. And this is an exploration of our inner nature here and a, and a map in a sense that they had worked out over time. So, uh, you know, just to put that in context, this is how I'm thinking about, you know, when, when they say, when Manley talks about spiritual or the book, the Hermes uh, text talk about spiritual, to me, it's, it's nature, you know, our nature. This light was the spiritual nature, uh, interestingly enough, of the great dragon itself. Hermes was raised into the midst of this divine effulgence um, and the universe of material things faded from his consciousness. I mean, he's obviously having uh, a, uh, you know, a, a vision, you know, some kind of experience within himself. Uh, Hermes is, and he's, and, and this story is presenting that story, which is fascinating that it's such a personal view from such a long time ago. Um, I mean, if our, if our, if, if our minds did evolve, uh, you know, individuality, one, it, it could be said that perhaps Hermes is one of the stories of the, one of our first stories about how, or at least, a, yeah, exactly that, a story about how we gained uh, consciousness and the ability to have our individual minds. Um, total, uh, you know, speculation there on my part, but I, uh, you know, there's quite a lot of, 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 of uh, research in, in this area that I think hints at that. Presently, uh, continuing the reading, presently a great darkness descended and expanding swallowed up the light. Everything was troubled. About Hermes swirled a mysterious watery substance, which gave forth a smoke-like vapor. The air was filled with inarticulate moanings and sighings, which seemed to come from the light swallowed up in the darkness. His mind told Hermes that the light was the form of the spiritual universe, and that the, and that the swirling darkness, which had engulfed it, presented material, um, represented material substance. This is really interesting. Uh, uh, again, just a little aside. Um, the um, he said it, he says it right here. Uh, it says it right here in the story. His mind told Hermes. Um, I believe you know what he's talking about. There is the ancient form of learning, uh, which is gnosis, which is spontaneous knowledge, which is, in my opinion, intuitive. You know, which is another way of knowing, not the whole way, not the only way of knowing. But I think a very powerful way of knowing ourselves, and and that is through, uh, that is through intuition. And and uh, you know, there's lots of evidence that our intuition can be fooled and is wrong sometimes. You know, but but what he's talking about here is very interesting. The story is talking about his mind told him, which I think that's fascinating. A fascinating um, kind of look into the process um, that he's going through here. Okay, continuing the reading. Then uh, this is by the way on page ninety nine of. Uh, of the secret teachings. Um, then out of the imprisoned light, a mysterious and holy word came forth. The, and that's the logos, right? The logos basically gave us a way to kind of a hedge against uh, kind of the, the void or the chaos of mind. Um, anyway, um, the holy word came forth and it took its stand upon the smoking waters. This word, the voice of the light, rose out of the darkness as a great pillar. And the fire and the air followed after it, but the earth and the water remained unmoved below. Thus the waters of light were divided from the waters of darkness, and from the waters of light were formed the worlds above, and from the waters of darkness were formed the worlds below. As above, so below, right? The earth and the water next mingled, becoming inseparable, and the spiritual word, which is called reason, moved upon their surface, causing endless turmoil. <laughs> endless turmoil indeed. Then again was heard the voice of Pomandres, but his form was not revealed. I, thy God, am the light and the mind, which were before substance and was divided from spirit and darkness from light. And the word which appeared as a pillar of flame out of the darkness in the Son of God is the Son of God, born of the mystery of the mind. The name of the word is reason. Reason is the offspring of thought, and reason shall divide the light from the darkness and establish truth and the mist of the waters. Understand, O Hermes, and meditate deeply upon the mystery. That which in you sees and hears is not of the earth, but is the word of God incarnate. I mean, in a real, in a real sense, what he's saying here is that your consciousness is God. Your awareness is God. And so, you know, it's closer than a breath. Yeah, because that is you. You are that, that sense of awareness. Uh, that, that's, that's one way that I read this. Um, that which in you sees and hears is not of the earth, but is the word of God incarnate. 
So it is said that divine light dwells in the midst of mortal darkness, and ignorance cannot divide them. The union of the word and the mind produces the mystery which is called life. As the darkness without you is divided against itself, so the darkness within you is likewise divided. The light and the fire which rise are of the div- are the divine man, ascending in the path of the word. And that which fails to ascend is the mortal man, which may not partake of immortality. Learn deeply of the mind and its mystery, for therein lies the secret of immortality. Now that's very interesting too, right? Even back, you know, even if it is a story just 2,000 or 3,000 years old, right? They're saying right there, they're thinking back then, you know, the mind is what's immortal. The mind is what's always here. The mind was here before the matter. Um, that's what ancient, you know, uh, that's what ancient esoteric science thought. So the dragon again revealed its form to Hermes, uh, picking up on page 100 of Secret um, of All Ages. And for a long time, the two looked steadfastly, one upon the other, eye to eye, so that Hermes trembled before the gaze of Pomandres. That trembling, I can relate. I think Carl Jung can relate. I think many can relate to facing the dragon. Okay, continuing. At the word of the dragon, the heavens opened and the innumerable light powers were revealed, soaring through cosmos on pinions of streaming fire. That's quite a description. Hermes beheld the spirits of the stars, the celestials controlling the universe, and all those powers which shine with the radiance of the one fire, the glory of the sovereign mind. I mean, in a real way, I, I think we, we, uh, we, we, we idolized our mind into a god, into god. That sense of consciousness we idolized in, 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 and anthropomorphized into a, a god. And, um, and here, this story is, is really um, kind of uh, giving a good kind of example of, of how they thought about this. So Hermes realized that the sight which he beheld was revealed to him only because Pomandres had spoken a word. Now, that's interesting. The word was reason. And by the reason of the word, invisible things were made manifest. <laughs> Sounds a lot like science, right? Divine mind, the dragon, continued his discourse. I like that. I like how this describes all of this as divine mind. Not God, not some being, but divine mind. That's interesting. The dragon. Before the visible universe was formed, its mold was cast. This mold was called the archetype. And this archetype was in the supreme mind long before the process of creation began. Now, that's interesting because that's exactly what Carl Jung said. And he must have used this as a source for some of his, uh, certainly as some inspiration for some of his theories crackpot or not. Um, Beholding the archetypes, the supreme mind became enamored with its own thought. So, taking the word as a mighty hammer, it gouged out caverns in primordial space and cast the form of the spears into the archetypical mold. At the same time, sowing in the newly fashioned bodies the seeds of living things. The darkness below, receiving the hammer of the word, was fashioned into an orderly universe. The elements separated into strata and each brought forth living creatures. The supreme being, the mind, male and female, brought forth the word, and the word suspended between light and darkness was delivered of another mind called the workman, the master builder, or the maker of things. In this manner, it was accomplished, O Hermes. The word moving like a breath through space called forth the fire by the friction of its motion. Therefore, the fire is called the sun of striving. The workman passed as a whirlwind through the universe, causing the substances to vibrate and glow with its friction, the sun of striving thus formed seven governors, the spirits of the pla- of the planets whose orbits bounded the world, and the seven governors controlled the world by the mysterious power called destiny, given them by the fiery workman. That's quite a quite a quite a story. I, I like it. When the second mind, the workman, had organized chaos, the word of God rose straight away out of its prison of substance, leaving the elements without reason, and joined itself to the nature of the fiery workman. Then the secret. Then the second mind, together with the risen word, established itself in the midst of the universe and whirled the wheels of the celestial powers. Infinite beginning to an infinite end. For the beginning and the ending are in the same place and state. So the serpent eating its tail, it it ends where it begins. Then the downward turned and unreasoning elements brought forth creatures without reason. Substance could not bestow reason. For reason had ascended out of it. The air produced flying things, and the waters such as um, such as swim. 
The earth conceived strange four-footed and creeping beasts, dragons, composite demons, and grotesque monsters. Then the Father, the Supreme Mind, being light and life, fashioned a glorious universal man in its own image. Not an earthly, not an earthy man, but a heavenly man dwelling in the light of God. The Supreme Mind loved the man it had fashioned and delivered to him the control of the creations and workmanships. That's interesting, right? I mean, this is a, a kind of a parallel um, creation myth, right? Um, the man desiring to labor took up his abode in the sphere of generation and observed. Now, this is the spiritual man he's talking about and the works of his brother, the second mind, which sat upon the ring of the fire. And having beheld the achievements of the fiery workmen, he willed also to make things and his father um, gave permission. The seven governors of whose power he partook rejoiced and each gave the man a share of its own nature. The man longed to pierce the circumference of the circles and understand the mystery of him who sat upon the eternal fire. Having already all power, he stooped down and peeped through the seven harmonies and breaking through the strength of the circles, made himself manifest to nature, stretched out below. So here comes human man, um, basically created through our curiosity, it seems, pushing into matter. The man, looking into the depths, smiled, for he beheld a shadow upon the earth, and a likeness mirrored in the waters, which shadow and likeness were a reflection of himself. The man fell in love with his own shadow and desired to descend into it. Coincident with the desire, the intelligent thing united itself with the unreasoning image or shape. So there we have man falling in love with his own image, Narcissus, right? The, the myth of, Narci of Narcissus falling in love with his own image. And then the intelligent mind unified itself with that unreasoning or emotional or uh you know irrational image or shape that 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 power that mind power had conceived of or reflected on earth it's like it had an, a desire that reflected maybe negatively or in an opposite image you know within matter um originating from the mind um and then manifesting you know as its opposite in, in matter uh so continuing um nature beholding the descent of man wrapped herself about the man whom she loved, and the two were mingled. Now, I can say that in my life, um, I, I know I have a sense of what that means for my, you know, my relationship with my wife. Um, and it's interesting because I do, you know, um, in a lot of ways, I think the female, you know, is the nurturing spirit, right, in the relationship. And, and they tend to give emotional security and foundation to the, to the relationship. Um, whereas the man is using his strength, right, to provide maybe, I don't know, that's more of a traditional view. Um, anyway, continuing, uh, for this reason, earthy man is composite. Within him is the sky man, the immortal and beautiful. Now, I think that has a reference to the diamond, uh, which is our highest self, our highest mind, the sky man. That's an interesting theme that shows up over and over and over in ancient, uh, in ancient uh, psychology. Um, without is nature. You know, nature being what is surrounding us matter. Uh, you know, I think that is, yeah, exactly. Uh, mortal, which is mortal and indestructible. The, so you have the, you know, destructible that is wrapping the uh, immortal. Thus, suffering is the result of the immortal man's falling in love with his own shadow and giving up reality to dwell in the darkness of illusion. Now, that's very interesting, isn't it? Here we are on earth, struggling away, you know... <laughs> Um, fall, fall, falling in love with our own image, right? Um, does that sound familiar? That sounds like the ego to me. Um, so, I mean, I think they had a very accurate way of describing our inner nature um, way back then. Um, you don't hear Jesus talking about this stuff necessarily. You don't get into the psychology of, you know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of uh, pronouncements because it's gone through so many different hands. You know, the word and the, the story of, of whoever Jesus was. Um, I just think it's interesting. Paul probably gave more voice to the, the Pauline, uh, uh, you know, the Pauline gospel is really the one that was spread all over the earth, which is basically a form of Judaism that was made uh, accessible to Gentiles who were not Jews. Right. Um, but, you know, Paul did a lot of writing. I think you could say he wrote about psychology and his uh, works and his abstractions and analogies were, you know, kind of maybe early forms of therapy. Right. All the letters he wrote to to the churches, et cetera. Um, Ah, that's fascinating stuff. Anyway, uh, so the man fell in love with his own shadow and desired to descend into it. Um, and he did. And the woman came to protect him and the, and the higher mind came to, to help him. 
Um, thus suffering is the result of a mortal man's falling in love with a shadow and giving up reality to dwell in an illusion. Four, being a mortal, man has the power of the seven governors, the power of the, of the sky. Also the life, the light, and the word. Being, But being mortal, he is controlled by the rings of the governors, or fate, or destiny. I think in a lot of ways what, what um, this journey that's portrayed through the esoteric teachings is doing is it's it's letting you take more control of your unconscious and becoming more aware of your unconscious so that you're not, your life is not so much governed by fate as much as it is by you making a choice. Um, Philip K. Dick wrote adjustment, the adjustment bureau, which is a story about that exact same theme, which I, I love that movie, by the way, with Matt Damon, that's a really interesting, fun movie. Um, and I think it's really cool. It's a Philip, Philip K. Dick story, which I think comes out of his study of alchemy and the esoteric as well. Um, of the immortal man, it should be said that he is a hermaphrodite or male and female and eternally watchful. That's really interesting, right? Because in our age, the hermaphrodite or the, the, there's so much, uh, focus on, um, you know, transgender folks. And I think that that's in the past, they would have seen transgender types or hermaphroditic, or, you know, a, you could say effeminate. And I think they would, you know, see them as more evolved, you know, or whole than regular, you know, people that were firmly based in one sex or the other. Uh, I don't think it's that simple. It's very complex, I think, actually. And, but, uh, but I think it's interesting, the parallels today with the openness in society that is, um, that's happening, um, especially in the area of, of sexuality. Um, it's funny, in the 60s, it was free love. But now, what, in the 20s, it's like not just free love, it's free gender love. <laughs> you know, you can have any, be any gender you want which I think is interesting. Um, and I'm not judging uh, that either way. I'm just saying, I think there's interesting parallels with the way the ancient psychology saw her, um, her, the hermaphroditic personality, um, which was a combination of male and female, not just one or the other. That, that implies that the higher self, that, 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 that the great work is really about, really it's about unifying the opposites and fire and water and emotions and mind uh, male and female, you know, all of these are, are balanced, uh, you know, we're balancing these opposites within us. Um, okay, continue the reading. He neither slumbers nor sleeps and is governed by a father, also both male and female, and ever watchful. Such is the mystery kept hidden in this day. For nature, being mingled in marriage with the sky man, brought forth a wonder, most wonderful seven men, all bisexual, male and female, an upright of stature, each one exemplifying the natures of the seven governors. These, O oh Hermes, are the seven races, species, and wheels. Okay. Continuing the reading on page 102 of the Secret Teaching of All Ages. After this manner were the seven men generated. Earth was the female element, and water the male element, and from the fire and the ether they received their spirits. And nature produced bodies after the species and shapes of men. And man received the life and light of the great dragon. And of the life was made his soul, and of the light his mind. And so all these composite creatures containing immortality, but partaking of mortality, continued in this state for the duration of a period. They reproduced themselves out of themselves, for each was male and female. But at the end of the period, the knot of destiny was untied by the will of God, and the bond of all things was loosened. Mm, that's interesting. Then all living creatures, including man, which had been hermaphroditical, hermaphroditical, were separated, the males being set apart by themselves and the females likewise, according to the dictates of reason. Then God spoke to the, whole, then God spoke to the Holy Word within the soul of all things, saying, Increase and increasing and multiply in multitudes all of you, my creatures and workmanships, let him that is endured, that is in, endued with mind, know himself to be immortal, and that the cause of death is the love of the body. And let him learn all things that are, for he who has recognized himself enters into the state of good. You know, I, I think that's a very interesting uh, point. Uh, so, um, if you have a mind and and you're aware and you're conscious, know that that is of the immortal. That that sense that 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 mind is an immortal mind. And, you know, you are an immortal, a composite, immortal, a composite of, of chaos and immortal forces that are cooperating for a period of time and forming you. I mean, that is a fantastic story um, and very uh, descriptive. Um, 
gosh, we we've la- we lack so much imagination these days when we talk about, you know, when we talk about our inner minds, you know, we're talking about aliens and we're talking about gods and demons and all that, you know, but I mean, these are, this is a, I don't know. I think this is a fascinating story of, of, of early. Um, and, and I think they're talking about also the, the, the ancient history of when our minds separated and then later when we became more aware um, and we became self-aware and individuals mm. anyway. Then, um, and, and when God had said this, Providence, with the aid of the seven governors in harmony, brought the sexes together, making the mixtures and establishing the generations, and all things were multiplied according to their kind. He who through the error of attachment loves his body, abides wandering in darkness, sensible and suffering the things of death. But he who realizes that the body is but the tomb of his soul, his nature, rises to immortality. Then Hermes desired to know why men should be deprived of immortality for the sin of ignorance alone. The great dragon answered, To the ignorant, the body is supreme, and they are incapable of realizing the immortality that is within them. Knowing only the body, which is subject to death, they believe in death because they worship that substance, which is the cause of of the reality of death. Now, interestingly, I think that's this is exactly what Christianity and other, uh, uh, you know, Western religions do. They adopt, they they idolize the body, and in actuality, they are materialists. They are not spiritual. They are materialists. They are trying to have the body alive forever. Now, that's interesting, right? That's a, that's an opposition to this ancient psychology of of, of uh, initiation. And you know, some of the descriptions in the text here. Remember, Manly P. Hall is adding some of his you know, some of the, he's kind of retranslated this based on the sources he originally mentioned. I like his translation. I like the way he puts it together. Um, but remember, you know, these are, um, you know, this is a story, but, um, what the, what the great dragon there says, the the great mind, wow, to the ignorant. I mean, there are some that they're saying they will never realize their immortality real. Um, and they're capable of it. They're missing something that, uh, that prevents them from seeing the light within them, at least according to the story here, according to the myth. Um, Then Hermes asked how the righteous and wise pass to God, to which Pomandrius replied, that which the word of God said, say I, because the father of all things consists of life and light. Now, why, if they're hermaphroditic, is it a father now, right? So, you know, there's some contradictions here, right? Um, Whereof man is made, uh, whereof man is made, if therefore a man shall learn and understand the nature of life and light, then he shall pass into the eternity of life and light. Now that's interesting. What you think about, you will do, you will be. Uh, that's kind of um, <laughs> one way to read that. Hermes next inquired about the road by which the wise attained to life eternal. And Pomandries continued. Now, by the way, um, this was the main search of Gilgamesh as well, right? In, our, in the ancient Sumerian story. Uh, stories one of the oldest written poem the oldest written thing that we have um, one of our the oldest story that we have written um so Pom- pomandries continued let the man in- endued with a mind mark consider and learn of himself and with the power of his mind divide himself from his not self and become a servant of reality now this is i think what the basis of magic and the and magical tradi- traditions are you could trace it back to the to this to these to these ideas in, in the corp in, you know in the hermeticum um that uh through the focus and training of the mind um you can learn and lead yourself um and learn to see what is real and what is not real and what is real is our being we are real we are here uh we have an inner reality we have we have awareness and within that the finite plays out, the personality plays out, the senses play out, you know, um, and uh, ah, it's fascinating. Um, Hermes asked if all men did not have minds and the great dragon replied. Now, I would say that that might be saying, hey, are there zomb- do all men have minds or are, are, are we zombies? Um, and Pomandri said, take heed what you say, for I am the mind, the eternal teacher. I am the father of the word, the redeemer of all men. And in the nature of the wise, the word takes flesh. By means of the word, the world is saved. I thought, or thoth, okay, um, the father, now thoth and Hermes are different, okay, and this is this is thoth here talking to Hermes. 
the father of the word, the mind, come only unto men that are holy and good, pure and merciful, and that live piously and religiously. And my presence is an inspiration and a help to them. For when I come, they immediately know all things and adore the universal father. Now you could say that's the Holy Spirit. Um, that's interesting, right? That may be one way to describe the Christian's Holy Spirit. Before such wise and philosophic ones die, they learn to renounce their senses. <laughs> exactly what I was just saying. Knowing that these are the enemies of their immortal souls. I, I think when you come, you can when you go through the process of initiation and through this psych, old psychological map and this old with this old map, um, you are basically learning to not to, that you can't trust your senses. That your senses are only giving you one view of the world that is actually more for utility than ultimate meaning. You know, the senses are just helping you walk around and not walk off a cliff. Um, but then again, they also, we can appreciate beauty and see and experience beauty, which inspires us. That's when the mind comes and it can inspire us to the greater heights too. So what is great art, right? What is great art, but that fire within us reaching out, trying to touch the sun again. I mean, trying to touch the sky again, the sky man within us, like reaching out, reaching back to the immortal, you know, to the, to the source of its being. And uh, it's it's sad that even then, you know, a couple thousand years ago, and I'm sure, you know, this is stories, you know, based on stories from 10, 15, as a, you know, probably more uh, thousand years. Um, there were men that just di didn't know they had they did not have the capability to be self-aware, to see the mind and, and to see that light. So this was the dawning of the age of awareness, you know, basically that these stories are, are, are mythologizing. And now in our modern age, consider there's so many parallels Um and, and it's almost like the cert, we've come back to the beginning. You know, we, we are appearing to end a cycle and we appear to be back where we started. But we come back with something. When we go around and we go into the depths, we, we bring something back. And I think that's really what we're talking about, that the, the value of, of, of meditation and focus on your inner mind is to learn to see the difference between your senses and your being. And that is the essence in, of philosophy, I think, ultimately, a lived philosophy anyway as well. So, uh, you know, this is powerful stuff. I mean, imagine this was being taught to priests and, uh, the, you know, to rich and, and powerful kings and queens. And, you know, I mean, I, I think that this is, um, you know, our earliest uh, systems were kind of based on this hierarchy, um, you know, this ancient hierarchy. Uh, it's fascinating right, to me. Um, so. Uh, continuing, I will not permit the evil senses to control the bodies of those who love me, nor will I allow evil emotions and evil thoughts to enter them. I become as a porter or doorkeeper, and I shut out evil, protecting the wise from their own lower nature. Now, I have to say something. Whatever initiation is, it does that. Things fall away, things that were destructive to you. And I'm not going to say good or evil. I'm going to say destructive or not. And sometimes destructive is good. You know, you have to clear out the old to make room for way for the new. But I have to say that this is all this principle is is real. This is ex I've experienced this. Um, you know, you do, you know, continuing in a good way protects you from your lower nature. Um, that's true. I think there's many, many all of us can attest to this. Uh, continuing my, the reading, um, but to the wicked, the envious and the covetous, I come not for such cannot understand the mysteries of the mind. I can speak to that as well. My silly, my silly family and some of my friends who simply cannot get it, get past their, their idolized experience of their body living forever. Anyway, I, if you want to know who I think is insane, it's those people, the ones that are thinking, you know, they're going to, they're going to forget about the life they have now for some life to come to make their, let their body live forever. But then they, they lived horrible as human beings in this life. And then all of a sudden they're going to attain something. I mean, it, it just doesn't make any sense at all. Um, but at least in this story, what you're seeing is it's a, this is a magical, this is a way of training your mind in, in a story, in a framework that lets you think clear, learn to think clearly. Not denying reason and logic, you know, but but seeing those as 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 allies, as valuable tools, um, and they were all like, hey, be on guard against your lower nature, be on guard against your your selfish desires, being you know, and yeah, instead of being on guard, if you focus and meditate on the higher things, on the higher mind, then you will be drawn to that, and and your whole life will follow that momentum. 
Hmm. And if, but if you don't even begin the journey or even do any of this exploration, then nothing changes. You know, you continue to be uh, thrown about on a, you know, on the on waves without any ability to to gain your, you know, to to gain to orient yourself to orient yourself. Huh. Okay. So uh, I leave them to the avenging demon that they are making in their own souls. Now this is the dweller of the, of the threshold, I think. Um, our fears and our evil create, you know, make a monster with us. Yeah. For evil each day increases itself and torments man more sharply. And each evil deed adds to the evil, adds to the evil deeds that are gone before until finally evil destroys itself. The punishment of desire is the agony of unfulfillment, unfulfillment, the punishment of desire is that no desire will ever fulfill you. That's exact. If it, phew, that's a powerful statement right there. I mean, I think that puts a lot in perspective, you know. Um, Hermes bowed his head in thankfulness to the great dragon who had taught him so much. And the, what is the great dragon? The great dragon is our mind, right? That, that the mind is teaching him through Gnosis and begged to hear more concerning the ultimate of the human soul. So Pomandres resumed. At death, the material body of man is returned to the elements from which it came. And the invisible divine man ascends to the source from whence he came namely the eighth sphere. The evil passes to the dwelling place of the demon, and the senses, feelings, desires, and body passions return to their source, namely to the seven governors who bestowed those upon man, whose natures in the lower man destroy, but in the invisible spiritual man give life. That's interesting. After the lower nature has returned to the brutishness, the higher struggles again to regain its spiritual state. It ascends the seven rings upon which sit the seven governors and returns to each their lower powers in this manner. Upon the first ring sits the moon, and to it is returned the ability to increase and diminish. Upon the second ring sits Mercury, and it is, and, and to it are returned machinations, deceit, and craftiness. Uh, all the gifts that made you, all the parts that made you yourself are let go of in death. That's what I think uh, Hermes is describing. Um, he says, uh, then being, uh, the, the great dragon, the minds, the great uh, supreme mind says, then being naked of all the accumulations of the seven rings. And we know there's more rings now because there's more planets, right? Um, and why didn't they know that if they were talking about <laughs> if, you know, so this is our mind at the time speaking to us, right? From the knowledge we had, um, the soul comes to the eighth sphere, namely the ring of the fixed stars. Here, freed of all illusion, it dwells in the light and sings praises to the Father in a voice which only the pure of spirit may understand. Behold, O Hermes, there is a great mystery in the eighth spheres, and for the, for the Milky Way is the seed ground of souls, and from it they drop into the rings, and to the Milky Way they return again from the wheels of Saturn. But some cannot climb the seven-ringed, a runged ladder of the rings, so they wander in darkness below and are swept into eternity, with the illusion of sense and earthiness. I don't quite know what that means. I think you, know, you can kind of guess what, I guess, what, what they're meaning there. Um, the path to immortality is hard, and only few find it. The rest await the great day when the wheels of the universe shall be stopped, and the immortal sparks shall escape from the sheaths of substance. Woe unto those who wait, for they must return again, unconscious and unknowing, to the seed ground of stars, awaiting a new be and awaiting a new beginning. Those who are saved by the light of the mystery which I have revealed unto you, O Hermes, and which I now bid you to establish among men, shall return again to the Father who dwelleth in the white light, and shall deliver themselves up to the light, and shall be absorbed into the light, and in the light they shall become powers in God. This is the way of good, the way of good, and it is revealed only to them that have wisdom. Ah, so the good ones get sucked up like a vacuum cleaner into the big light. Oh, isn't that great for them? <laughs> I don't know. Um, okay, continuing. Blessed art thou, O son of light, to whom of all men I, Pomandres, the light of the world, have revealed myself. I order you to go forth, to become as a guide to those who wandered in darkness, that all men within whom dwells the spirit of my mind, the universal mind, may be saved by my mind in you, which shall call forth my mind in them. Establish my mysteries, and they shall not fail from the earth, for I am the mind of the mysteries, and until mine fails, which is never, my mysteries cannot fail. With these parting words, Pomandres, radiant with celestial light, vanished, 
mingled with the powers of the heavens, raising his eyes unto the heavens. Hermes blessed the, fa blessed the father of all things and consecrated his life to the service of the great light. Even back then in the great, we got people becoming missionaries and going to spread their gospel, right? I mean, that's an ancient theme, it seems. Um, anyway, continuing, last paragraph on 104. Thus preached Hermes, O people of the earth, men born and made of the elements, but with the spirit of the divine man within you, rise from your sleep of ignorance. Be sober and thoughtful. Realize that your home is not the earth, but in the light. We have, why have you delivered yourselves over unto death, having power to partake of immortality? Repent and change your minds. Depart from the dark light and forsake corruption forever. Prepare yourselves to climb through the seven rings and to blend your souls with the eternal light. Well, I don't know about that gospel, but that is one version. That is one way to say probably kind of what Jesus said. And is not Hermes an early form of Jesus? Jesus just being another version of the Herm of the Hermetic uh, archetype, right? Um, who was speaking for God or the mind? I think Hermes is actually closer to, to you know, to the essence of it than, than the story of Jesus, who's gone through so many different hands. You know, we can't even know what's what, really. I mean, you know, sure, there's there's a lot of scholarship there. Um, but uh, to me, it's much more, Hermes' story is just much more interesting than Jesus's. Um, but again, Jesus spoke to the common people. Hermes is speaking to the intellectual, I think. Um, some, some who heard, now on top of 105, some who heard mocked and scoffed and went their way, delivering themselves to the second death, from which there is no salvation. Now that, I wonder what that is. Hmm, interesting. But others, casting themselves before the feet of Hermes, besought him to teach them the way of life. Is that not the, didn't Jesus talk about the way? Hmm, Hermes, Jesus. Interesting. He lifted them gently, receiving no approbation for himself, and staff in hand, went forth teaching and, and guiding mankind and showing them how they might be saved. In the worlds of men, Hermes sowed the seeds of wisdom and nourished the seeds of the immortal waters. And at last came the evening of his life. And as the brightness of the light of earth was beginning to go down, Hermes commanded his disciples to preserve his doctrines inviolate throughout all ages. The vision of Palmandres, he committed to writing that all men desiring immortality might therein find the way. And in, in concluding his exposition of the vision, Hermes wrote, the sleep of the body is the sober watchfulness of the mind, and the shutting of my eyes reveals the true light. That's interesting, because under psychedelic influence, when you shut your eyes is really when you see things. My silence is filled with budding life and hope, and is full of good. My words are the blossoms of fruit of the tree of my soul, for this is the faithful account of what I received from my true mind. That is Pomandres, the great dragon, the lord of the word through whom I became inspired by God within the tr with the truth. Since that day, my mind has been ever with me, and in my own soul it hath given birth to the word. The word is reason, and reason hath redeemed me. For which cause, with all my soul and all my strength, I give praise and blessing unto God, the Father, the life and the light, and the eternal good. Gosh, that sounds a lot like Jesus. I mean, too much like Jesus. Wow. Holy is God, the Father of all things, the one who is before the first beginning. Holy is God whose will is performed and accomplished by his own powers, which he hath given birth to out of himself. Holy is God, who has determined that he shall be known and who is known by his own to whom he reveals himself. Holy art thou, who by thy word reason has established all things. Holy art thou, of whom all nature is the image. Holy art thou, whom the inferior nature has not formed. Holy art thou, who art stronger than all powers. Holy art thou, who art great, greater than all excellency. Holy art thou, who are better than all praise. Accept these reasonable sacrifices from a pure soul and a heart stretched out unto thee. O thou unspeakable, unutterable, to be praised with silence. I beseech thee to look mercifully upon me, and I may not err from the knowledge, that I may not err from the knowledge of thee, and that I may enlighten those that are in ignorance, my brothers and thy sons and daughters. Therefore I believe thee, and bear witness unto thee, and depart in peace and in trustfulness into the light, thy light in life. Blessed art thou, O Father, the man thou hast fashioned would be sanctified with thee, as thou hast given him power to sanctify others with thy word and thy truth. So Hermie, uh, so Manly wraps up the chapter. 
um, with um, the vision of Hermes, like nearly all the Hermetic writings, is an allegorical exposition of great philosophic and mystic truths. And its hidden meaning may be comprehended only by those who have been raised into the presence of the true mind. So there you go. We read the great testimony of the true mind, but only if you are of the true mind can you divine the hidden meanings. We're back to mysteries and hidden in, in secrets, but really those are those are just set up as as uh, tests in a way, I think. So that's it.